Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Last time I talked about the Schmidt trigger, a device to make an analog signal into a clean 1-bit digital signal. Since I want to build some circuits for electronic music, I want to make some sound that has a pitch, since all that I've made so far is noise. So let's look at how a Schmidt trigger can be made into an oscillator. In case you didn't watch the previous video, let's quickly review what an inverting Schmidt trigger does. It's a device with an analog input, that is, a voltage that can vary continuously, and a digital output. Let's start with the input voltage at a low value. The output voltage will be a logic high. As the device's input voltage increases, the output voltage will remain at logic high until the input reaches a threshold, and then suddenly snap to a logic low. As the device's input voltage decreases again, the output voltage will stay at the logic low level until the input reaches a different lower threshold, and then suddenly snap back to a logic high. When the input voltage stays between the two thresholds, the output voltage does not change. If it started out logic high, it stays logic high. If it started out logic low, it stays logic low. We'll use V sub I L and V sub I H to denote the lower and higher input thresholds. And use V sub O L and V sub O H to denote the logic low and high output voltages. Here you can see the actual behavior of a packaged 40106 Schmidt trigger on my oscilloscope. I'm driving the device with a triangle wave from a signal generator. Note that the x-axis is stretched. The output is swinging 5 volts, while the input is varying by about 800 millivolts. The bowing that you see in the vertical lines comes about from the fact that the trigger has to draw a large amount of current from the power supply when the circuit is switching. This distorts the power and ground references for everything else. It's very hard to decouple all the power supply transients on a breadboard. That's one of several reasons that the legendary Bob Pease called a breadboard the white slab of trouble. I can use the oscilloscope cursors to measure the voltages at the trigger points. I'll be using these numbers later in the calculations for the oscillator. Now let's use this Schmidt trigger to make an oscillator. We'll use a circuit like this one. Call the voltage across the capacitor V sub C and the voltage at the trigger output V sub out. We'll also want a name for the voltage across the resistor. Call it V sub R. Of course, Kirchhoff's voltage law lets us compute any of these voltages from the other two. Let I be the current through the resistor. When the current is flowing from right to left, as shown here, the capacitor is charging. When the voltage of the capacitor hits the upper threshold, the output voltage will switch and the capacitor will discharge. Then the current will flow the other way, until the voltage on the capacitor reaches the lower threshold, the output switches, and the capacitor starts charging again. Either way, Ohm's law gives us the current. The Schmidt trigger input draws negligible current, so Kirchhoff's current law says that the current into the capacitor equals the current through the resistor. We know the formula for the current into or out of a capacitor. Put everything in terms of V sub R, and set the two currents equal. Transform this differential equation to an integral, which can be solved with a little bit of elementary calculus. Now we can solve for V sub C. I'll do that part on algebra autopilot. Let me make some room on the blackboard. We're still left with A, which was a constant of integration. We can solve for A by choosing a time t equals zero and letting the voltage be V0 at that time. At time 0, the exponential part of the equation will be unity. We can substitute the value of A back into the equation to get the voltage across the capacitor at any other time. We're interested in determining the time that the circuit will spend charging or discharging the capacitor. That's equivalent to asking, when will the voltage reach some value V1? A little bit of algebra answers that question.
Let me tidy up the blackboard again. This is the equation for both charging and discharging. During the part of the cycle when the capacitor is charging, the inverter output is V sub OH, and the capacitor voltage starts at V sub IL. That part of the cycle will end when the voltage reaches V sub IH. During the part of the cycle when the capacitor is discharging, the inverter output is V sub OL, and the capacitor voltage starts at V sub IH. That part of the cycle will end when the voltage returns to V sub IL. The oscillator period is just the sum of these two values. Factor out the RC time constant, and the highlighted factor contains only the constants that we just measured with the oscilloscope cursors. Plugging in those numbers gives a simple formula for the period and frequency of our oscillator. This basic calculation works for any Schmitt trigger. Plug in the threshold and output voltages, and you get the formula. Here's the first oscillator that I'm going to build. There should be a link to the schematic in the video description if you're playing along at home. I'm using a 100 nanofarad polyester timing capacitor, because that's a nice middle-of-the-road value. It's important to use a polyester capacitor and not a ceramic one. I've tried to choose a resistance range to give a useful range of audio frequencies. Let's go down to the cave and set this up on the breadboard. Okay, I've got the circuit built up on the breadboard over here. Let me turn this thing on and see what it sounds like. About what I expected. It tunes from a note down on the tenor register. To one about three octaves up in the stratosphere. The square wave is the typical fat square wave sound, rich in the odd harmonics. And of course it looks like a square wave on the scope. If I switch over to a triangle-ish wave, it continues over the same pitch range. But with the purer tone of a triangle wave. Not as sweet and flute-like as a sign, and not as rough and rich as a square wave. Just for fun, I tried to make an oscillator that would generate something close to actual musical notes. I measured the timing capacitor on a capacitance meter, because I was using a 5% tolerance capacitor. It measured out at 104 nanofarads. I scaled to the resistors accordingly to come as close as I could to the standard frequencies of musical notes. I made a six-note keyboard out of junk push buttons. I stopped at six notes just because I ran out of this style of junk button. The oscillator sounds a little sharp and measures about 2% high in frequency. I couldn't measure the hysteresis more accurately than that using the oscilloscope anyway. Aside from that, it's not too far out of tune. It'll produce a recognizable melody. This circuit was sort of okay, since I was making only one of it, but it's not going to be repeatable if I want to make more. Just look at the datasheet for a typical prepackaged Schmidt trigger. Running off a 5 volt supply, the low trigger point can be anywhere from 0 0.9 to 2.8 volts, and the high trigger point anywhere from 2.2 to 3.6 volts. Wait, what? How can the max low threshold be greater than the min high threshold? There has to be some dead band. Oh, the manufacturer also gives a min and max spec for the hysteresis voltage. But it varies by a factor of five. If I put that in a music circuit, that will shift the tuning by more than two octaves. 
There has to be something to do about this. Well, the voltage is usually consistent among ICs with the same lot number. If you did a quantity buy for all the units you ever intend to make, it could work. But there are no guarantees. You could also try to make the device adjustable and tweak each one to be in tune. That's a lot of tweaking over a wide adjustment range. Or you could do your own Schmidt trigger using an op-amp comparator. That's where I want to go next time, so stay tuned. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious.